Welcome back everyone to another episode of the JS Podcast. I'm your host, Euras, and this week we're back talking about the Jombini Ramsey case. Um, this is episode number 10, so I'd say it's quite an occasion. Um, you know, we just reached a double digit number amount for, you know, in terms of at least how many episodes I've done already. So it's pretty cool, it's pretty interesting, and also it's really cool that I'm going to be concluding the John Benny Ramsey case. And, uh, you know, we already talked about on the uh, two episodes that I've already done on this case, you know, the first part was all about the timeline of events leading up towards the time when John Benny Ramsey was actually discovered. Um, in that, you know, wine room in the Ramsey's residence basement. There was a lot to discuss in that episode. Um, I suggest everyone who haven't uh, seen those episodes uh, to check them out uh, before you actually delve deeper in this episode, because this is the conclusion episode, right? And, you know, on the previous episode, on episode number nine of the JS podcast, we actually talked a little bit about how... Um, like the evidence in the scene right in the case like there's some really interesting evidence in this case such as you know the 911 call the hand write uh, the like the ransom note obviously i think everyone knows what I'm, what I'm talking about right so we've already covered that and we already got those details out of the way and i think we've built a really good foundation to really look at the main two theories uh you know in regards to what actually happened to John Benny Ramsey on Christmas night in 1996. So obviously I'm talking about the intruder theory, you know, that someone potentially snuck into the house at some point in time, killed John Benny Ramsey. Uh, so that's a theory, as well as the fact that uh, the family member theory, you know what I'm talking about, that someone from the family killed John Benny Ramsey and then a subsequent cover-up was in place. So I don't want to conclude uh, my you know personal opinions just right now i will give give them at the end of the show that's going to be one of the sections that i have planned um i will say i do see a lot of sentiment going towards the line of thinking that potentially john benny ramsey was actually killed by a family member and then the family is uh you know uh, subsequently actually covered it up so I can't wait to get into all of this. Now, I'm not going to tell you which way I'm leaning right now. And trust me, I have a lot of details to go through uh, regarding both of the theories. And I actually want to start out with the intruder theory. So after I'm done talking about the, the intruder theory and everything that I have managed to gather about that, I will be jumping to the family member theory. And after that, I will give my final conclusions. And yeah, I hope everyone's as excited as I am. I'm pretty excited to talk about this case. I will say I have never done this much of preparation before an episode ever before. Like the actual recording day of this episode has been pushed back by two days at this point. Like I was supposed to re record two days ago. So I'm so behind on my schedule, but uh, what the heck? I mean, it's episode number 10. It's a momentous occasion for the podcast, as well as this is a, a crazy case that can't be done half-heartedly. You have to really go in in this case. And we're going to go in, guys. We're going in right now with the intruder theory. Right, so before we actually talk about potential intruders which <laughs> there's so many it's crazy but before we actually talk about the intruders i want to uh, talk about some details uh, that would sort of uh, give us a better sense of uh, how the whole situation would have even worked right so i would like to uh, talk about like i would like to split the intruder theory section into even more sections which uh, the first section of that would be the logistics you know how would even how the logistics side of things would even work for the intruder because before we actually talk about actual people who may have entered the Ramsey's residence and killed the John Benny Ramsey we have to really figure out how is that even a possibility right so the first thing uh, that comes to my mind when I think about the logistics of an intruder entering the Ramsey's residence right is how and when would the intruder actually enter the Ramsey's residence 
I want to quickly jump back to the timeline of this case to see what was the most plausible time for the intruder to actually enter the house. You know, when did he strike? So let's remember the fact that John Benny Ramsey was last seen alive on 10 p.m. on December 25th of 1996 you know this is going still by the according official theory that you know family members were not involved and you know uh i believe patsy ramsey was the last one who saw john benny ramsey at 10 p.m uh, on christmas night you know and then you know and that night someone snuck into the house and and killed john benny ramsey so this is uh we're still investigating this line of thinking so don't uh, think that I'm uh, necessarily leaning this way that she was last seen alive at 10 p.m. Uh, this is just us talking about the intruder theory so it would not make sense for me to talk to put any suspicion to cast any suspicion in regards to the timeline because we are right now investigating the possibility of an intruder coming in the house so we're gonna be talking about the family member theory fairly shortly uh, I mean when that uh, times time comes to jump to that section but right now we're still focusing on the intruder theory so the story goes that you know at 10 p.m john benny ramsey was last seen alive so off the bat i would like to mention one thing that i feel really strongly about and that is i find it very hard to believe that if an intruder is responsible for the death of john benny ramsey that he had been at the house hidden somewhere longer than 24 hours like that just does anything like even 24 hours like sounds insane and hard to believe but anything uh, before that is just crazy in my opinion so i think the possibility goes like you know if john benny ramsey was officially last seen alive at 10 p.m on the 25th then i would say 10 p.m on the 24th you know that's my line of thinking is like the the earliest possible time like plausible time that an intruder could have entered the house now even that sounds really crazy and i do feel strongly that if an intruder did commit this crime he had to enter the house um, like and kill john benny ramsey within hours at like at the very most you know but but let's just um, go with this for a little while one thing i want to mention about the house is that it's very large and there are various stories of people living in other people's homes for months and even years without getting detected. But it's just so unlikely, in my opinion, that I don't want to focus uh, on any time um, even like earlier than 24 hours before Jobini Ramsey was... Uh, you know seen alive i just wanted to mention this because i remember the uh stories where like in japan there were like uh you know squatters living in like ventilations ventilation systems and for like years before the owner of the, that house noticed uh that they were present you know that's a creepy thought to have for sure but i just wanted you know to mention that fact uh, i i think it's super unlikely that an intruder stayed hidden at the family house for a long period of time you know that's just crazy so let's focus a little bit on the 24th of december you know one day before christmas because i think that's probably the earliest time that a potential intruder could have snuck into the house you know the ramsey residence in fact a great opportunity did present itself and was available for an intruder on the 24th when the Ramses actually left for twilight service at St. John's Episcopal Church in Boulder. So there was a time period on the 24th when the intruder could have entered the house. Now, I don't think the time is known when the family left, but, you know, that's a thought. But as I've entailed a little bit earlier, I don't think that the intruder entered on the 24th if an intruder was in fact responsible for the killing of John Benny Ramsey because of two reasons. And I want to go over these two reasons. The first would be that on the 24th, the Ramseys actually gathered presents from the basement and placed them next to the Christmas tree. So there's a high chance that if the intruder was at hidden at the basement or something like that on the 24th, um, he would have been pretty lucky not to get noticed, you know, if he was in fact hiding in the basement, which I think is the easiest area to enter of the house. 
and the easiest area to hide in the house. Like, I find it very hard to believe that an intruder uh, hid somewhere else for a, uh, you know, a long period of time because I've looked at the floor plans of the Ramsey residence and there are multiple guest rooms, there is this attic, I believe, so there are areas where you could hide, but I believe it's, I mean, maybe the attic, who knows, right? But I, I just have a strong suspicion that on the 24th, it's crazy. And, you know, the other big reason why... I don't think that the intruder was hiding already on the 24th in the Ramsey's residence is because why would you wait the whole night then wait the whole other day, if you know what I mean? Like, if you are already at the house on the 24th, why not sneak into John Benet's house, uh, I mean room, and, and, you know, do your thing on the 24th? Why would you actually wait until 25th you know it doesn't make any sense unless the intruder was like thinking oh i'm gonna give her like her last christmas or something like that which is you know i think it's blasphemous to think that way so i think i, th I will say i highly believe that it had to happen on the 25th sometime at the 25th now there are two times Two different time periods when an intruder could enter the house on the 25th. And to make sense of that, I want to remind everyone what the Ramses actually did on the 25th. And that is, they left, the whole family left for a Christmas party at the White's residence. You know the White's, uh, they were close family friends of the Ramses, and later on they became like almost like enemies because whites had high suspicions that the Ramses were involved in the killing of John Benny Ramsey. You know the same Fleet White and 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 his wife and things like that, right? So the the Ramses actually went to their home for the Christmas party. Now the time given for them leaving the home. To go to the Christmas party is somewhere in between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. in the evening. So we don't know exactly when, but we know that they left somewhere in that uh, time period. So they actually return from the party. We also don't know when they return, but I probably estimate that the, the fastest possible time for their return home is 9 p.m in the evening and this is being very generous because i actually don't think it's even possible to do it uh earlier than by 9 30 p.m but just for you know uh estimation safe estimation purposes let's say it's 9 p.m so let's say the the uh the latest possible time they left the home is 6 p.m. in the evening and the earliest possible time they arrived the home is 9 p.m. in the evening so that would be three hours um for an intruder to potentially enter the house while the ramsey family is at the white's christmas party now that's that one period of time when the intruder can enter the house and then I think the, the second uh, part, the second period of time when the intruder can enter the house is after everyone goes to sleep and I think the last person was John Ramsey and I think he went to bed at 10.30 p.m. So I'd say either the intruder, if the intruder killed John Benny Ramsey, he had to enter the house somewhere in between 6 to 9 p.m. in the evening or 10.30 p.m. to, I would say, 5 a.m. next morning because I would at least think an intruder would need at least 45 minutes to to do everything like that's the bare minimum right because you still have to write the note and the notice like you need to write it like it takes at least 20 minutes to do that so i mean 45 minutes i really doubt it but just for like a plausibility um you know if you're looking at it from what's actually plausible then i think that time frame is still plausible even it's super unlikely in my opinion the other thing i want to quickly stop at 
is the actual Christmas party. So at the Christmas party, nothing seemed strange. And um, I think, um, you know, Fleet White or whatever uh, said that the family seemed um, pretty happy and they were enjoying the festivities. You know, John Benny Ramsey seemed normal. Brooke Ramsey seemed normal. Patsy seemed normal. John was normal. Everyone was just sort of chilling out. Uh, doing their party things, right? Uh, celebrating uh, Christmas. One other thing to mention here, uh, I think it's pretty important. On the way back home in the family car, uh, the two kids allegedly fell asleep. Now, one interesting fact is that the White's residence is only like, what, a little over a mile away from the Ramsey's residence. So it's not like they had to drive for like a half an hour to get to the White's uh, residence, right? It was a quick, I'd say, five minute drive. I found it very suspicious that the kids fell asleep in the vehicle knowing that they were only driving like one mile, right? So that was pretty strange. Also, let's mention the fact that the Ramses did not head straight home after the White's Christmas party, right? I think they went to two other neighbors' homes and we know that uh, after they left the Christmas party at the White's, they dropped off gifts at Stewart and Roxy Walker's residence, as well as the Glenn and Susan Stein's residence. I think these are the neighbors. Remember when I said that I found, uh, you know, the kids falling asleep at the car pretty suspicious? Well, this actually gives us a pretty good insight into one certain detail, and that is how fast after returning home the kids actually went to bed because if they were already sleeping at the vehicle on their drive back i would actually assume that they would want to hit the hay uh, immediately almost right after they went back home and since you know the kids went to bed at around the 10 p.m ish area I would probably say that they had to arrive home at around 10 p.m. also. So, you know, me giving that 9 p.m. earliest point, um, you know, time frame of an intruder entering a house, that's very generous. You know, we would assume that sleepy kids from that vehicle were still awake for one hour. You know, six-year-olds are not, when they're sleepy, I would assume they're, they're, they're sleepy, you know, they don't want to stay awake for any longer, if you're, if you're a sleepy six-year-old, you're probably gonna want to hit the hay immediately after you go back home, so that's one thing to think about, and another thing to think about is, you know, the actual second possible time, time frame of an intruder entering the house, that's after 10, 30 p.m., when, you know, the last person in the family, that would be John Ramsey, officially goes to bed right so let's investigate that uh, time frame just a little bit okay so remember when i said that the latest possible time for an intruder to enter the ramsey's residence was 5 a.m on the 26th you know the following day i will actually try i would want to push that back even a little bit maybe to like let's say 4 30 ish am on the 26th now wh why i say that i just realized i need to make a little bit of a correction here let's remember that john benny ramsey was found missing on 5 45 am on the 26th but actually patsy ramsey was awake as early as 5 30 a.m you know so i don't think the intruder was present at the house at the same time as when Patsy Ramsey actually woke up. I think the parents waking, waking up, you know, they would have noticed an intruder somewhere in the house or something like that. Like, that's a strong suspicion in, in my opinion. But I will say, even that doesn't make any sense because of these critical details that I find are, are actually connected to this case. And this is very important. So, these are critical, very critical two details. And let's, um, whenever I'm going to be, right now I'm going to be talking about them, but let's actually emphasize them in our heads because I personally believe this is very critical to this case. So what the hell am I actually talking about? Well, the first critical detail is actually 12 p.m. That's midnight, right? So uh, on midnight, Scott Gibbons, who was a neighbor, looked out of his kitchen window at the Ramsey's residence and observed the upper kitchen lights were on and dimmed low. 
So 12 p.m., you know, midnight, one hour and 30 minutes after the last person went to bed, that's John Ramsey, there was a light. Now, you know, you could say that that light is had been turned on, you know, during the day and just the Ramses forgot to turn it off. I don't know the details and maybe this is not as critical as my next detail that I want to present to you and that is that another neighbor, Melody St Stanton, heard a loud scream. Now, the time of the scream was somewhere in between midnight and 2 a.m. Because at that time, I don't think she thought much of it. So she didn't take the courtesy to actually, you know, make a timestamp in her head. She just remembered she heard a scream somewhere in between midnight and 2 a.m. So I don't know. Like, I would say this scream... Uh, let's 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 think about it. This is very critical because these two details actually could give us a sense when suspicious activities were happening at the Ramsey's residence. Now I want to go back a little bit to that dimmed light. You could argue that an intruder had entered the Ramsey's residence and maybe turned on a light to figure out where he was potentially. I will say that's pretty odd in my opinion. I think an intruder would not want to turn on lights at the house as it, as it is very suspicious, uh, a, a suspicious action and you could uh, get noticed by someone, you know, in the family. Um, I would say like probably a, a intruder would carry with himself a flashlight of sorts uh, and like, you know, try to sort of be as um, you know as sneaky as possible now another line of thinking someone went wake woke up from the ramsey's family you know and went for a snack a midnight snack or maybe they left something it they don't necessarily need to eat anything maybe they left something at you know the upper kitchen or something like that now this is very important because i don't think anyone from the ramsey family stated that they actually woke up in the middle of the night to go for like a snack or something like that to the upper kitchen which is pretty suspicious why was the light on then if no one woke up right and then you know, they said that they went to bed at 10.30 p.m. on the 25th and they woke up on the 26th at 5.30 a.m., right? And 15 minutes later, they found that Jomini Ramsey was missing. I know a lot of uh, people in the audience already are speculating that this is the time when, you know, potentially uh, Burke Ramsey went for that midnight snack and then, you know, uh, Jomini Ramsey also awoke and stole a piece of pineapple. And, you know, then Burke Ramsey, as speculated on the CBS uh, documentary that, you know, uh, Burke Ramsey later sued them successfully. Uh, you know, they speculated that that's when, you know, after Jumpin' Ramsey stole a piece of pineapple, Burke Ramsey hit her with potentially that flashlight that was also found in the kitchen, and, you know, then the family members covered up the murder of Jumpin' Ramsey. So that's a whole line of thinking. We're not focusing on that just now, but what I do want to focus on is that scream that was heard uh, somewhere between midnight and 2 a.m. in the morning. That's very important, and this is why. Firstly, we don't know if the scream actually came from the Ramsey's residence. I don't think this information is available because if it did, if it was, I mean, then in my opinion, it's a done deal. It's a done deal if we knew for a fact that a scream, a loud scream came from the Ramsey's residence, right? Somewhere from midnight to 2 a.m., it's a done deal. The case is closed, and this is why. If a scream was loud enough to be heard by a neighbor, there is no chance, in my opinion, that that scream was not heard at the Ramsey residence. If that scream was loud enough that a neighbor would, you know, take a men mental note of that, then there is no chance that the Ramses would not at least notice it or remember something 
Now, the Ramses say they slept. Like, everything was good, they slept. So they didn't hear the scream. So, if the scream was actually coming from the Ramses residence, I think the likelihood of an intruder kidnap, like not necessarily kidnapping John Benny Ramsey, but like killing John Benny Ramsey, an intruder actually killing John Benny Ramsey, and then John Benny Ramsey screaming, that's impossible because the Ramses would have noticed that as well. There's no way in hell that, you know, John Benny Ramsey made a scream loud enough to, you know, be heard by neighbors, but not by the family members. How does that even work, right? Right, so to conclude the timeline of the intruder theory, I'm thinking, you know, I already gave the possible time frames for an intruder to enter the house. Now, I will say, if we could find out whether or not that scream came from the Ramsey's residence, if it did actually come from the Ramsey's residence, I will say, I think family members are responsible and are covering up. That's just my personal opinion. Now, if we know that that scream is unrelated to the Ramsey's residence, then we don't really know what happened as of yet. I did look a little bit more into the scream a little bit, and there are varying reports on what the neighbor actually heard. Some sources state that she changed her mind eventually on what she heard, and actually some people state that she changed her mind after the Ramses got to her. So this is very speculative. I have zero information regarding the validity of these claims. Zero. This is just something that's been put out, but I have zero validity, so this may all be complete BS. Since we are talking about how, you know, the logistics would work in the intruder theory, I think uh, the second very important part here that we need to talk about is actually the entry points right because you know we know the time frame but we don't know how the intruder would have entered right i think a good source of information regarding this and this is like an official source finally uh is the actual search warrant and you know the results of that search warrant according to officers french and Weich. Uh, who were the first ones to arrive at the house on the 26th. So their statement is, there were no signs of forcible entry into the Ramsey residence. Now, the Ramseys believed that the house was locked when they went to bed. This is very important. The Ramseys did think the house was locked. But, you know, later reports painted a different picture and Pretty much, law enforcement officials told Newsweek that the police knew several windows and a door had been unlocked that night. Two windows were open slightly, allowing electrical cords for the outside Christmas lights to pass through. So, to conclude the entry points, you know, there was a window that was slightly open. Apparently, there was a door that was also unlocked. Um, so, it's pretty strange. I don't really understand the full situation here. But I will say, you know, just for the sake uh, of actually investigating every single possibility, I will say um, there, were, there were possible entry points in the house. I know that on that CBS documentary, it was heavily disputed that, uh, you know, the intruder could not have entered through the windows because of that spider web, right? I won't be returning to this piece of detail. I know it's really, really important. That's why I'm mentioning it right now. There was apparently like a spider web. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a detail that is really emphasized by everyone who is talking about this case. There was the spider web and apparently you can't enter, you couldn't of you couldn't have entered the basement through the window without um, knocking off the spider web because the spider web was definitely, it seemed like it was there for a while. So uh, the intruder, um, uh, you know, 
couldn't have knocked it off and the spider wouldn't have enough time to make another cobweb there i think that was the reasoning right so um people on cbs argued that there's no way the person could have entered to the through the windows and it was very important because uh, i guess uh, lou smith was actually you know a police detective who pretty much came to the conclusion that jambini ramsey was actually you know the, the person who is responsible for killing jambini ramsey actually entered entered through that window and then you know the cbs guys and, and girls they were like disputing that whole line of thinking so you know now that i found out that there was actually an open door i don't know there seemed like it seemed like there were other avenues to enter the house that's why i don't want to like stop here because we still have like a lot to discuss here so i will say there was there was a I mean, the police people said that they, you know, found um, unlocked doors, you know, that night. So I don't know what to make of that, you know. So I think if the police says that, I have to go with the police and say that there were ways to enter the house, right? Before we jump to the persons of interest in this case that could actually be, you know, potential perpetrators of... Uh, you know, of the killing of John Benny Ramsey, I want to mention a few facts that will paint a better picture of the situation. As of early 2004, there were roughly 140 possible suspects in the John Benny Ramsey case. As of August 2006, Boulder District Attorney Mary Lacey asserted, and this is her quote, I'm guessing between the Boulder PD and our office, we've probably looked seriously at 200 people. Seriously at 200 people um, and done investigations into those 200 people. That's not saying that we've done buccal swabs on all of them. We haven't. There are DNA samples taken on a lot of different suspects so that's the quote from mary lacy the da then you know who two years after this cleared the ramses she did get backlash from other district attorneys from you know different districts i guess dr robert keppel who worked um, the green river killer case it's a pretty famous case brought a lot to that uh, to the table on that particular case because of the way he dealt with the vast amounts of files involved i think he had like really good management skills or something like that he became a consult consultant on dealing with you know these huge cases such as the john benny ramsey case right it, it's a massive case right and he said that in over 90% of the cases, like these big JonBenet Ramsey level of cases, right? The name of the offender was in the police files within the first month or so. So that's pretty interesting. Over 90% of the cases, police in the first month or so already at least, you know, knew of a potential suspect who did end up being, you know, the, the culprit. So... Thus, his, his line of thinking is, it's far more likely than not that the killer is someone already identified by police, but not all the, you know, 140 possible suspects. There was a very similar case, unsolved case, that happened nine months after, you know, the John Benny Ramsey's death. A girl who attended the same dance studio as John Benet Ramsey and lived only two miles away from, you know, John Benet, had been assaulted while her mother slept nearby. So this happened at night, and this happened nine months after John Benet Ramsey's case, and, you know, the girl who got assaulted was 14, so she was quite a bit older than John Benet Ramsey, but she was a part of that same dance studio. Now, the culprit in that particular case has never been identified and has since been dubbed the ninja. So some people are thinking that this could be the same person who potentially killed John Benny Ramsey. I will say that in that particular case, the 14-year-old girl was actually sexually assaulted, like pretty 
how should I put it, like like the 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 culprit inserted fingers in certain areas and I would assume he left DNA so that would mean to us that uh, probably the police would have already connected the DNA found on John Benet and the DNA from this guy so I find it hard to believe that it was the same guy but I mean it's something to think about as well. It has also been determined that there had been uh, more than a hundred burglaries in the Ramsey's neighborhood in the month before John Benny Ramsey was murdered. And also a, a 48 hours reporter uh, stated that within a two mile radius of where the Ramseys once lived, you know, referring to the house uh, in the in Boulder where, you know, they lived at the time of John Benny Ramsey dying, 38 of their neighbors are registered sex offenders, you know, so, you know, there's, there's something right there. And I will say that this is very important now because right now we'll we will be jumping to the intruders potential intruders in this case like actual people finally right after what like a good half an hour of uh you know sort of uh intro introductionary uh, uh parts to the actual people so i will say that we need to remember one thing uh when we are looking at certain persons of interest in this case in my opinion, it is very important to remember that the key piece of evidence used in clearing the Ramsey family in 2008 was the DNA found on John Benet Ramsey. Now, I talked on the previous episode about the three samples found on two pieces of clothing, the long johns and that blood stain in John Benet Ramsey's underwear. Now, those two really small DNA samples belonged to the unknown male who has not matched any of the people I'm about to talk about, like any. I'm pretty sure everyone that I'm going to be talking about as potential intruders, they've all been tested for DNA or I would assume the vast majority and police did not connect DNA to them. So I know that some of these stories may, that I'm going to be talking about may seem very compelling, but let's remember that DNA was not connected to that particular person. So they had DNA. If police felt strongly about one of these people I'm about to talk about, they would have tested their DNA and they would potentially make a connection. But this connection was never made. So let's just keep that in mind. Let's keep that in mind as a filter, potential filter, because I may sound convincing when I talk about a certain person or another person, right? But let's remember the DNA, right? So let's jump into the people. So there are different lines of thinking uh, regarding the intruder theory in regards to what was the actual goal of the intruder because we could have intruders who were sexual predators we could have intruders who were burglars uh, stumbling upon John Benny Ramsey and doing some creepy stuff for some reason we could have foreign factions uh, trying to get back at America, right? Uh, we could have various different reasons why an intruder would enter the house. I, don't, I would like to start off with the sexual predators because I think it, that's the most likely thing here, in my opinion. If an intruder did uh, enter the house, I think the motive was of sexual nature. First person I have is Felipe Esso. Now, this was not his real name. This was actually a code name that has been used for this person who apparently flipped out soon after the murders. Now, this is very hush-hush and there's not a lot of information on this particular person. Um... Also, let's remember the DNA. I mean, the DNA most likely cleared this guy. But the information I have here is that Felipe Esso, who was, you know, just a code name, was actually a young man. Um, and, you know, investigators emphasized that he is not a sex offender. So that's something to know, that he was not like a known sex offender. He was merely convicted of being a sex offender and the registration is that of a person convicted of the offense is not an admission of having committed the offense for which he has been convicted i mean it's a 
whoa, this is crazy. I'm, I have no idea what I've just read. So basically, this man also had the troubles with wealth issues and he was apparently cheap labor to paint the Ramsey's home for a subcontractor. So I don't think he was directly connected to the Ramsey's. He was connected to a person who was connected to the Ramsey's, who was hired by the Ramsey's to paint their homes. And I think Filippi Esso, I think this name sort of indicates to us a little bit of a foreigner um, vibe here. So I would say someone who's probably not from United States, not a US citizen, uh, just trying to get by, you know, has uh, money issues and was painting a home painting the house or something like that so that's the first person we have here uh, I'm not really sure uh, what to make of this guy because there's not a lot of information so let's move on to the next person there was a guy named Matthew Falcon so the Falcon he was dubbed the Falcon by the way was a Boulder University student who confessed to attacking Jessica a 22-year-old psychology student in December of 1997. He also was investigated in connection with the Susan Chase murder that occurred during the same month. Susan Chase was also a student who was sexually assaulted and murdered, but another man called Diego Alcalde, yeah, that's his name, was actually charged with these uh, crimes. So that's the only thing we have on this guy. I, I think he's a, he's not a, a very popular person of interest, Matthew Falcon, right? We have another Boulder University student called Mike McElroy. And McElroy was a really messed up guy, in my opinion. He was a student who hosted a website with pornographic articles about the murder and rape of young girls so that's that's uh, something right there photos of sexual bondage and a story about how to have violent sex with a barbie doll uh, was posted on that website and it's live right now like you could find this information right now definitely no links because i can't but I've read it and I will say that story of how to have sex with the, that Barbie doll is probably the most disturbing thing I've read in the last, I'd say, 12 months for sure. So, and I've read some disturbing stuff like I do true crime. So, yeah, that's, that's something right there. There are nothing really direct linking Mike McElroy to the John Benny Ramsey case, but he did have an obsession with Barbie dolls and serial killers, and this is reflected in his uh, website. And as, as I've said, old copies of that website are available right now, so you could actually go and surf like this dude. So, to summarize this guy, who has been dubbed the Prophet, uh, Prophet was an interesting character in Boulder. He attended the college, was a local DJ, and had a website depicting Barbie, Barbies in various stages of bondage. He was considered on the net as the expert in the art of Japanese bondage knots. He, is in, he in fact wrote an ultra-violent short story entitled I'm not gonna read that title, but it's the same story that I've, you know, just referred to. So yeah. Oh, before I forget, uh, he also had a stun gun that was confiscated from him. So, you know, uh, like the main detective at that point, you know, Lou Smith theorized that John Benny Ramsey was subdued with a stun gun. So this guy also had a stun gun. Now the stun gun is a really, like a gray area for me. I don't really see how you would hit someone with a stun gun and that person would like get paralyzed but there are cases actually i think i might return to this i might not uh, later on in the show but there are actually cases of young children actually getting stun gunned and getting paralyzed so this is not out of the question completely but it's just like uh 
Would you really bet on the stun gun subduing a child uh, rather than him screaming? I mean, I mean, if you're going in with that logic, like you really have to know what would happen to your child if you use the stun gun. And I think at that point, the information was not widely available. So how would you be so sure that a stun gun would subdue a child? I mean, I don't want to get into it right now. Also, there are statements that, you know, uh, Mike McElroy was actually investigated in January of 98, so you know, around two years after the fact, and uh, Boulder PD took some samples of his writing, they took his stun gun, his shoes, and a bit of DNA, and subsequently cleared him, and actually Mike McElroy apparently actually sent out an email to his friends uh, sharing this whole experience, stating that Boulder PD actually took him shopping after the fact, uh, after they confiscated all of his possessions, uh, so they took him shopping to replace all of his items, pretty much. So that's that's um, the case on Mike McElroy. You know, let's remember that all of these people are apparently getting cleared by DNA. So it's not like we're we're in the unknown. Like the guy was apparently cleared by DNA. So, you know. Do we still think he's a potential person of interest? I mean, you tell me, right? Okay, so now we arrive at a very interesting man named Gary Oliva. Now, this guy seems to be the main person of interest in this case. Apparently, he's like the main... If, you know, if, if we would have a poll and we would have um, suspects... And the question would be, which of these potential suspects you think is the most likely one who killed Jumbini Ramsey? I think uh, Gary Oliva, you know, in the public forums or whatnot, he would probably win this poll. And I would actually suspect by a large amount because I will say I also found this guy very suspicious and let's go, let's do it. So Gary Oliva was a paranoid schizophrenic with a history of sex offenses and apparent interest in John Benet, at least after her death. He also owned a stun gun, black duct tape. Remember that black t duct tape that I found very interesting how uh, it was not found in the family residence? Um, you know, the duct tape that uh, was covered, uh, that covered John Benet Ramsey's mouth, everything else was found in the family residence, but the duct tape was not. Uh, he also, this is a crazy detail, he used a garrote similar to the one found on Jomini Ramsey in an attempt to strangle his own mother, right? He also had an opportunity to actually uh, enter the house as he was a transient known to be in the Ramsey neighborhood at the time of Jomini Ramsey's murder. Now, his handwriting was apparently similar to that used in the ransom note, and he also expressed remorse over having done something very bad to a little girl. So let's dissect all of this. He actually spent time in a mental health facility after the murder of Jomini Ramsey. He made Oregon's registered sex offender list in 1991 for molesting a young girl. Um, that's crazy. In 2016, the magazine Rolling Stone reported that Oliva was actually recently charged with two counts of sexual exploitation of a child for possessing child pornography. He was last reported by the Denver Post to have been arrested in June uh, and held on a $100,000 bond and is scheduled to appear in court later this fall. In regards to his apparent interest in John Benny Ramsey, well, there are two things to mention here. So the first thing would be that uh, at a one-year anniversary anniversary vigil for John Benet Ramsey in December of the following year, 1997, uh, a few photographs were taken by private investigators working for the Ramseys, and they revealed that uh, this guy was in the front row of John Benet Ramsey's vigil after one year, so what the hell, right, why is he there? Uh, he also carried pictures of John Benet, 
So he fell under suspicion after Boulder police learned he had broken into a building at uh, Boulder University. So uh, looking through the transient's backpack, police found a stun gun and a poem he'd written about John Benet Ramsey and Suzanne Chase. You know, remember that other girl that uh, was sexually assaulted and murdered but uh, a different person is um, already locked up for Suzanne Chase's case so uh, I think this could so sort of entail to us that maybe he was not uh, the offender of these uh, particular crimes but he just sort of gained interest in them because one thing to mention about um, Gary Oliva here is that I don't think he had any connection to the case before police actually found out that he broke into a uh, university building uh boulder university building so he was doing like crazy stuff right breaking into like university buildings that's a crazy lifestyle right there but i don't think prior to this he has he had any connection i believe to the uh to the case i'm sure maybe they already knew of him because of his past as a sex offender and I'm pretty sure they must have known about his close proximity to the Ramsey's home at that point in time, but I don't think he had any sort of uh, poems written uh, on John Benny Ramsey or like taking pictures of John Benny Ramsey before John Benny Ramsey was killed. Because if that was the case, then we got our guy right here. You know, like the case is closed pretty much. But I do, I think he only started doing these things after the death. So and he was uh, a paranoid schizophrenic. So let's let's take this into consideration before we move further into this guy. Now the pictures uh, from that one year vigil for John Benny Ramsey in 1997 showed him holding a folder sealed tightly with a strip of smooth black duct tape now what do you know uh john Benny ramsey's mouth was also covered by a black duct tape that was not found in the ramsey's residence so that's something to think about there for sure he did have that stun gun you know uh, and people are theorizing that maybe john Benny ramsey was subdued with a stun gun he did try to strangle his mother with a very similar growth, right? He did live close to the Ramsey's house and his handwriting was similar, although probably, in my opinion, not as similar as Patsy Ramsey, but still similar. I've seen it, similar, but get this, guys. This is not it. You know, the, the one thing that really creeped me out is that he called his high school friend, Michael Whale, you know, and told him he hurt a little girl so i mean it's just a call right why am i emphasizing right he made this call late at night on the 26th so it was not the 25th you know it was not uh, on the same day, on Christmas Day, when John Benny Ramsey was last seen alive, it was the next day. So by that time, he could have already uh, seen the commotion and he could have already found out what was happening uh, because probably everyone in the neighborhood knew at that point. So I think he could have had this information already if he was even there at the scene or something like that. But if he wasn't at the scene or didn't have the means to get to this information uh, that John Benny Ramsey was missing, uh, well, that's very suspicious. But it's still on the 26th. If it if the call was made on the 25th, then god damn, this is so compelling. But it's still the 26th. Let's remember 26th, right? He also sent letters to the same Michael Whale where he outright confesses uh, to killing John Benny Ramsey. And I believe some other girl as well. Uh, so we have that as well. So we can see how he's uh, a very um, a popular person of interest in this case, but I will say that he was cleared by DNA. Once again, another guy who's cleared from DNA. Uh, his DNA did not match the DNA found on Germany Ramsey. 
And let's remember, he was schizophrenic and paranoid, and I think it's super definite that it's not out of the question for Gary Oliva to just become like obsessed with this case after the fact, because he was also implicating himself, I believe, in the Susan Chase case. So he was implicating himself in another case, and I think, you know, the likelihood that he actually killed Susan Chase and John Benny Ramsey, and now someone else is sitting in jail for a Susan Chase uh, murder, you know, it's it's highly unlikely. So if this guy did kill John Benny Ramsey, then he killed John Benny Ramsey, but then he also lied about being involved with Susan Chase or something like that. And there, and when investigators eventually did question him, uh, he said that he didn't kill John Benny Ramsey, but then later on sent email uh, like those letters to that friend that I've mentioned that he says that he killed, I think, both Susan Chase and John Benny Ramsey. So. I think he's definitely insane, that's that's a fact, but that black duct tape, you know, I mean, what the hell was even in that folder, you know, that folder that he had with him on that one year anniversary at uh, John Benny Ramsey's vigil, like, why are you even there, Gary Oliva, what the hell, man, so it's, uh, you know, I'll leave this up to you guys, I don't want to put unnecessary information in your heads uh, quite yet regarding my opinions because we have some more dudes to talk about here. We have a man named James Allen Shelby. He was a serial rapist and he was serving a life sentence and he did commit uh, to killing uh, John Benet Ramsey and another girl, Daniel Van Damme, who was also murdered. I will say, I always find very suspicious uh, the statements coming from lifers. I mean, you're a lifer, dude. I mean, I'm not really gonna believe what you say, and it's not like the dude had anything to lose. And this is actually highly emphasized that, you know, he did confess to killing John Benet Ramsey on 2003. Uh, I believe it was in summer of 2003, right? But then the following year, in November of 2004, he actually commits suicide by hanging uh, in Pima County Jail in Tuscon, Arizona. So, I mean, the guy was not even from the same area and there's, I don't think there's literally anything linking to him. So he was just some crazy lifer who confessed. The killing John Benny Ramsey, I think this is uh, a super, like a, this is a super stretch that he actually did that. So I will probably say this is the probably one of the more unlikely uh, persons of interest in this case. The next person, we once again don't have uh, the name. We only know his nickname, The Warrior. So apparently he was an Indian, uh, American Indian. Uh, who had studied political science at the University of uh, Colorado at the same time when uh, Susan Chase was murdered. And that happened one year after John Benny Ramsey was murdered. So the information we have regarding this, uh, the warrior guy, is that he was tall, he was violent, he was a young man who had nearly killed his mother in Virginia by striking her across the head with a shotgun. Police became concerned when they went into the bedroom of his apartment and found it wrapped with, hun with hundreds of news clippings from the Suzanne Chase and John Benny Ramsey murders. So, um, the shotgun. The shotgun was wrapped in hundreds of news clippings from those two cases. That's pretty interesting. Um, the warrior's roommate had told investigators that the warrior had made a bumper sticker that stated, I killed her. And then the roommate reportedly asked the warrior uh, about the sticker. The question is, which one, Suzanne Chase or John Benny Ramsey? And the warrior replied, either or so it's uh it's something there i think I, I don't know like he he definitely seems like someone who is obsessed with the cases at that point in his life but let's remember that dna he probably probably tested and he's probably clear let's let's remember the dna evidence okay now we have another uh, big time person of interest john mark 
Carr. Now, I'm sure most of you have already heard about this guy if you have been looking into the John Vinnie Ramsey case because he's actually the dude who was actually arrested in Thailand uh, while he was working as a, an English teacher. And one of his uh, confessions in Thailand, I think he was arrested uh, for uh, possession of uh, child pornography, but he was actually... You know, he then confessed to actually killing John Benny Ramsey, and he has an interesting connection to the Ramsey family. So let's let's uh, start at the beginning with uh, with this guy. So John's connection to the Ramsey family begins when he, uh, way back in the day, uh, was working as a teacher, and was also living in Georgia because you know originally the Ramseys were also from. Uh, Georgia and also uh, you know attorney Lynn Wood uh, has told the press that the Ramseys gave police information about John Carr before he was even identified as a suspect so that's a pretty significant thing to mention um, now the same attorney would not say how the Ramseys knew Carr so we don't know that but Jean Benet was born in Atlanta in 1990 and the Ramses lived in the suburb of Dunwoody about 30 miles northeast from Conyers uh, and Conyers was another city where John Mark Carr lived so he lived like 30 miles away from the Ramses back when the Ramses were living in Atlanta now you know, Jomini Ramsey did return on some occasions back to Atlanta, and one of those occasions was the National Sunburst Competition, where she won the second place. Uh, and it was happening on August 13th in 1996 in Atlanta, Georgia. And John Mark Carr, he is a pedophile at this point, at least that's what's stated here. I don't know the exact reasonings here, because to my understanding, he's a free man at this point, but... Um, as a pedophile, it would not have been illogical for Carr to have attended such an event or at least read news about uh, this event later on, right? So this may have put John Benny Ramsey in his headlights. Any news about this might well have mentioned that John Benny Ramsey had earlier lived in Atlanta, so, you know, we already have that connection. And even, I think, he mentioned like access graphic or at least he was mentioned with like connections to access graphic you know uh, john ramsey's company so it's interesting because apparently john carr was also internet savvy and may have been able to learn a lot about access graphic remotely without having to travel uh from Alabama to do so because he apparently lived there for some, uh, I'm assuming, right? And that's important because, you know, the ransom note had uh, the same exact money amount that was the Christmas bonus uh, for John Ramsey. I'm not really sure if that if that information is like in the company's documents or something like that, or, or at least something that you, not being a super good hacker could obtain that information of the amount of money John was receiving for his Christmas bonus. So I don't really know uh, anything in there, but uh, he was actually arrested for the murder of John Benny Ramsey on August 16 in 2006 after he uh, confessed. But at that point, he was already like a suspect in the case. So... Why he was in Thailand is because he was actually teaching the English language there. He was actually booked uh, because he, I believe he had ch child pornography on his computer. So that's why they arrested him in Thailand with that connection. But I believe on the same year, 2006, when all of this was happening, he actually got cleared of all the charges uh, regarding the John Benny Ramsey case because his DNA was not matched with the DNA found in on John Benny Ramsey. So once again, we have a mismatch in DNA happening. Now, I think he now lives with a new identity that was provided to him by law enforcement, I believe. And he's not sitting in jail because remember those charges regarding the child pornography? Well... They were not filed against him, apparently, because they lost 
like the evidence. So, you know, don't ask me how that happens, but apparently that's what happened. They lost the evidence, apparently. But I still want to talk about how his confession went down and what he stated. So he said that he entered the house at 5 p.m. So remember, just as I've said, like the probably the earliest possible time for an intruder to enter. So that it matches up with what he said. He entered the house at 5 p.m. Uh, when the Ramses left for the Whites, right? Now, Carr has said publicly he was with a six-year-old when she died and called her death an accident. So he said that this was an accident. And according to the Thai officials who had held a news conference at which Carr appeared briefly, um, Carr insisted his crime was not first-degree murder. He said it was a second-degree murder. And he said that he unintentionally killed Jombini Ramsey. He said he was in love with uh, Jombini Ramsey. So that's pretty interesting for sure. Uh, also, he told the Thai officials that the motivation for kidnapping Jombini Ramsey, because he didn't want to kidnap Jombini Ramsey, was to get 118 thousand dollars that was left in the ransom note entailing that you know he wrote the ransom note but his plan apparently fell apart not really sure why and he ended up strangling John Benet Ramsey to death so more details uh, regarding what he claimed is that he had entered through the basement window he had carried John Benet Ramsey from her bed without using a stun gun he hung her in the basement vertically while he asphyxiated her with a garrote while sexually assaulting her orally. Uh, he also accidentally killed her in the process because in his passion, he hadn't paid attention to the length of time she was being asphyxiated. Then he deliberately stroke her in the head with a blow to be certain that she was dead uh, for fear that she might awake and suffer once he left or might be brain injured because he was in love with John Benny Ramsey. Place, uh, he also uh, placed on her mouth a piece of duct tape from the flashlight he had brought and then unexpectedly had to use to kill her so he said that he brought a flashlight and then used a duct tape of that flashlight don't know how that works but this will play a part in my conclusion regarding uh, john uh, carr uh, also uh, he pierced her uh, vagina three times so he could taste her blood then he walked upstairs to leave the ransom note in her bed, but upon hearing a noise upstairs, instead, you know, someone made a noise, he left the note on the stairs and quickly hurried back to the basement because, you know, that's what's happening. I mean, yo, maybe he did hear someone going for that midnight snack because, you know, at midnight, a up upstairs kitchen, you know, light was was on so maybe this is that i'm not saying that's what happened but you know it's something right um so and then he apparently also abandoned his plans to take john benny ramsey with him uh, because he didn't want to get detected he then undressed her when he saw she had urinated uh he then put oversized underwear uh, and took the underwear that had urine in them with himself exited through the basement window and you know taken with him the flashlight so yeah this this account ties together pretty much all of the evidence at the crime scene but this is the important fact regarding uh john carr is the fact that not a single detail from this statement not a single detail was not 
publicly disclose. So everything he said, if you were following the case, especially this is 2006, so forums were already posting all of this information. So if, you, if you're following this case, you know all of these details and you could come up with this story in like 10 minutes. So he knew every single detail of this, or at least he could have known beforehand because this, he didn't bring anything new to the table. He did not tell us where the duct tape was stashed, where um, like other things were stashed. And then also his DNA was tested and it did not match the DNA found on John Benny Ramsey. So for a guy who he, uh, apparently pierced John Benny Ramsey's private area three times, undressed her was like doing all sorts of stuff he he want he his quote is i wanted to taste her blood like this is her his quote right and then to not have dna i don't know i, I, I just feel like it's probably highly unlikely that this guy was involved because i mean how do you do all of this right and you don't leave any dna right so because his DNA was tested, it didn't match, and I don't know, guys, it's up to you to decide, but in my opinion, it's sounding like this is highly unlikely, right, so I think we've uh, went through all the sexual predators, uh, potential sexual predators in this case, um, some other interesting details, uh, there was a party happening at the house, that was pretty near the Ramsey's residence. And this is allegedly, I'm not really sure if this is substantiated by any uh, proof or anything like that, but I think this just comes from like an internet poster who claims that there was a wild party a few doors away from the Ramsey's that began around 2 a.m. and went until 6 a.m. involving at least two individuals who subsequently were jailed and uh, yeah, I think that's all we have here. I think law enforcement never contacted these individuals who were subsequently jailed, but I mean, who jailed them? Didn't law enforcement jail them? Or anyone else present at the party? Even though police observed these people leaving early in the morning because they were called early in the morning. So I don't know. I don't want to speculate here any any more. But if there was a party happening next door, I mean, who knows, right? Who knows? Okay. The obvious next thing we need to talk about is the foreign political faction because it is stated in the ransom note that it was a foreign faction. So I already talked extensively about the ransom note, and I will say I strongly believe that the ransom note was made as part of a staging of the crime scene. So I don't think it was actually a foreign faction that did the killings. Doesn't really make any sense. And the, the note, the ransom note, in my opinion, was not written with the intentions of actually getting the ransom. You know, no one actually called the, the Ramses and they didn't even kidnap Jumbany Ramsey and they didn't even extract her from the house. So you know, I, I don't know, like rationally thinking, like I think the note is the sole reason for the note is to stage that this was a kidnapping turned into a murder, murder but I think it's a murder uh, staged as a kidnapping. So that's what I think uh, had happened. But apparently not everyone thinks like this because Lou Smith, that investigator, right, who concluded that John Benet Ramsey was killed by an intruder, he states that his quote is, I believe that the killer had started out with a kidnapping in mind. I believe that he was going to take her out of the house. Uh, there is some evidence to suggest that he did perhaps try to put her in a suitcase. I wonder what that, uh, that evidence is because I have not ran into it. Uh, maybe it's not disclosed publicly. Uh, also, Lou Smith says perhaps he couldn't get the suitcase in the window and then get out of the window himself. Perhaps he got into the window and couldn't pull the suitcase out after him. So I don't know why he suddenly went to that basement room 
fashioned a garrote from something that was right there in plain sight and brutally murdered Jean Benet. Perhaps she knew him, perhaps she screamed, something triggered this man to kill Jean Benet in a very brutal fashion. So as I've mentioned uh, on the previous episode, I strongly believe that uh, this was a murder posed as a kidnapping. So Lou Smith's comments make absolutely no sense to me, but uh, maybe he had his reasons to believe uh, in this line of thinking, right? Also, some people are stating that maybe a potential burglar came into the house uh, while, you know, he was committing a Christmas night burglary, but I will say that there were actual burglars connected to this case uh, by law enforcement, but once again, everyone that I'm reading here had their DNA tested and they did not match. And then also there are various other serial killers linked to this case, but I don't necessarily want to get into them because they're like if we're gonna be talking about like serial killers we have to like bring everything we know about them to this podcast so i'm just gonna leave it at that but at least uh we have uh, a person called gary mcgreen connected to this case but this is crazy because it involves fleet white being involved so let's just leave that uh for everyone who wants to look into it on their own time we, ha we also have the oakland county child killer who was killing kids in Oakland County in Michigan in the 70s. Some people think that he may be involved. Once again, let's not go down that rabbit hole right now. Some other, at least, mentions that I think should be mentioned here is the alleyway boogeyman. Now, uh in Steve Thomas's book, you now Steve Thomas, I think he he was like uh, in the law enforcement or something like that. He like made the various comments regarding the case. In his books, he states one of the father uh, of the local community, I guess, claimed he he had came across a crazed looking man standing beside a truck behind the Ramsey house, holding some white cord and a stick, and was grunting, and he, he said, you can't have her, she's mine, so this, this, oh, so this was an actual man, and he was homeless, and he was investigated, so, as well as uh, the ninja who attacked Amy, remember that other girl, her name was Amy, she was 14, she was from the same dance studio, so maybe Ninja Guy who managed to escape, maybe he's also involved, who knows. Also there was a street Santa, basically a man dressed up as Santa Claus in the street for money, I think he did that, uh, like a, that was his gig, right? So a private investigator, Brenda Sirenen, quote, believes the killer is a street or mall Santa who John Benny met and is also a hunter or trapper. Serene sent her study to retired Colorado homicide cop Lou Smith, you know, the same guy, uh, for years, a lead detective on the John Benny case and Smith found it so compelling he interviewed Serene and then hand delivered her information to Boulder DA Mary Lacey. So, I mean, Lou Smith is out here wiling out. He's like, yo, I believe this guy. I think that could have happened. Oh, you have a theory? Let's hear it. Oh, that's that sounds credible as well. We also have to mention the pedophile sex ring that apparently was present in the area while all of this was happening. You know, some believe there was a pedophile sex ring operating in Boulder and that this best explains what happens. So yeah, I'm trying to read some more about this right now. So apparently from what I've gathered regarding the sex ring theory, it's being, it's like a weird situation where we don't really have any information uh, and there's no proof of it being like there being a sex ring in boulder but i have heard about this sex ring in boulder so 
I'm really curious. Maybe someone in the com comments or something like that, or or someone could like email me with more information because this is compelling. But I don't know the information, and I'm reading here that actually the DA at the time uh, actually said that he does not believe there was a sex ring in Boulder. And that was Alex Hunter, the DA, who denied this information. So I don't want to get into it. Uh, maybe someone has some better information than me because this is like a deep, deep, uh, you know, uh, rabbit hole right here. Also, I think uh, it's worth mentioning Access Graphic employees because I think some Access Graphics Access graphic employees definitely were investigated by the police, but uh, they didn't connect anyone to the murders because let's remember that uh, uh, on the ransom note there was information about you know how much money the Ramses should prepare to cough up for their daughter, but that number of money, the amount of money, was actually the same amount as uh, John's you know, Christmas bonus, so maybe someone from Access Graphic knew this information, but apparently there's like a list of people here. I don't want to necessarily mention these people because I don't think, at this, at this point, this is probably doxing those people, but yeah, so I guess they have been investigated and nothing was found, but there are some employees who were fired recently that may have had some sort of bad feelings towards John Ramsey, so maybe maybe i mean the, the ransom note did sort of indicate that this was a person who had like a like a like bad emotions towards john ramsey you know so i don't know what to make of that probably I'm probably leaning towards that you know since no one matched dna probably no one did that or i don't know what do you guys think regarding the axis graphic employees also there were the neighbors such as Glenn Mayer, I think. So, actually, uh, Glenn's uh, widow wife, who was 85 at the time when she made her statement, he, her quote was, I believe my husband killed John Benet. I knew he was capable of it. When I asked him if he murdered her, he would just smile at me. He wouldn't deny it. So, I don't know, this is, goddamn, how deep is this gonna get, you know? And then also we have, uh, like, the neighbor's kids, because there are people who are proposing theories that maybe when the Ramses, you know, after leaving Fleet White House, you know, leaving that Christmas party, were actually still dropping off gifts at some neighbors. So maybe one of those neighbor's kids, because there were, like, boys living in the neighborhood, actually trailed them to the house but then again you know would would the boy a young boy write a note uh, with you know like words foreign faction so i, th I definitely don't even want to get into that oh yeah let's remember fleet white himself is a person of interest uh to some internet posters because he did, f um, like, the reasoning there, I think, is because he did uh, sort of, d his relationship with the Ramses deteriorated, and he then accused the Ramses of, or at least speculated to some degree, that the Ramses may have been involved and were withholding information from the investigation. I think he stated something like that, will you please just come out clean with all you know, and things like that, so... Some people are thinking that Fleet White was involved. I mean, in this case, like, if you just mention Germany Ramsey, you're, like, Im immediately a person of interest. So, I will say, I don't really have any information about Fleet White other than it was pretty curious. It was pretty interesting to me how he did open that wine cellar uh, door but didn't notice Germany Ramsey's dead body. So, I uh, will see. That's probably the only thing I have like a little gray area in regards to Fleet White, but I personally don't think he was involved. I mean, I have no information regarding this, but now we are jumping to some people that finally, after getting through all of these loonies, loony toony uh, theories, we're finally jumping to something that has some merit in my opinion, and that would be Linda Hoffman Powell, 
and to some extent her family. So Linda Hoffman Powell was a 57-year-old housekeeper and she was named actually a possible suspect by the Ramses themselves. Uh, Linda's husband, Mervyn Powell, was the Ramsey's handyman as well. I will mention him briefly. And now this is the theory that's uh, that sort of in, entails that uh, Linda was responsible for the death of John Benny Ramsey and how this whole went down. And Linda actually will make an appearance, I believe, again when I talk about the family member theories. Okay, so this theory actually begins with Linda asking... Patsy Ramsey for a loan of $2,000. Now we know that this was a real thing that did happen. So Linda asked for two G's as a loan, but Patsy denied. Now I don't know when this happened. Was this like right uh, before Jobini was killed or not? Because I heard like some statements that for a while now at that point, Linda was not uh, working as a housekeeper for the Ramseys, but I don't know the this particular information. But he, she did... Uh, she did get denied for the money. So let's remember the money situation, right? The money is also named in in the ransom. So maybe she had access to the information how much uh, John Ramsey had. And you know, when I think about the ransom note, I always think about my think like why not ask for a million dollars, but maybe for a you know a a a, a somewhat of a simple housekeeper such as linda she doesn't need a million she just needed two thousand so maybe if she's gonna commit this crazy crime right maybe she's gonna ask for what she knows the ramses could easily pay if that makes sense right right so also linda's family or at least in her family home there was black duct tape with nylon cording also they had recently been in the window windowless room apparently you know the basement room they apparently the family knew of the broken window because linda's husband right the man that i've mentioned earlier mervyn pow he was actually the handed man who was supposed to fix that window that was broken in the basement so they knew about the window I, apparently they had access to john's payroll stubs uh, they needed money, apparently. They knew the Ramses were going to Charlevoix. Oh, and also, I think she was still working for the Ramses, by the way. And she was supposed to work on the same day when John Benet Ramsey died, but she, for some reason, denied going to work that day. So I think the motive here is that she needed money. And then there is her husband, Mervyn Powell, who was the handyman and probably could also be of help so some people think that if linda was involved and her husband was also involved mervyn and mervyn was a weird guy apparently allegedly i don't know why uh, well i know why but i don't know if this is credible because they had a daughter linda and mervyn called ariana pow and apparently someone found pictures in online porn pornographic websites where there are pictures taken by Mervyn Powell of you know his daughter Ariana Powell so I don't know what that's all about but allegedly there could be a situation where Linda's husband Mervyn Powell was like a pretty much of a creepy ass guy apparently but I, I feel like this is highly not credible and probably not true but if that was the case, then this could explain the apparent uh, sexual assault on Jumpini Ramsey's body, you know, the damaged um, vagina area and things like that. So, god damn, I don't know what to make of this, but apparently they had, they, I will say that these guys probably had the best possible ability to plan out this killing out of all of these uh, potential suspects, right? I think the Linda Hoffman Pow, since she knew the family, she knew the look, she knew how the house was, right? She knew the house plans. So I think she for sure, out of everyone, had the best ability to plan out the kill, 
right i think she definitely did but i will see i find the motive a little bit too weak i mean you're gonna do it for two thousand dollars come on you know i mean there has to be like a deep grudge against uh like the ramsey family and you would like actually go and like kill a, 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 a kid that you're a caretaker for i mean i don't know this seems a little too much but I mean, they're definitely worth mentioning here, and actually, Linda will also come up, I believe, uh, when I talk about the family member theories. Okay, so this concludes the intruder theory portion of this podcast. It's definitely the largest rabbit hole I have ever encountered in any case I've looked at so far. The sheer amount of persons of interest proposed are mind-boggling, we have everything from psychotic sex offenders, international English teachers with child porn on their computers, burglars, offenders of similar cases, you know, such as 14 year old girl dancer from the same dance school as Jumpy Ramsey. We got multiple Boulder University students here as well, a potential sex ring operating in Boulder. We have people who worked with uh, and for the Ramses. We, ha we have neighbors and we have even their kids. So we have, you know, pretty much everyone in the neighborhood here. But to conclude the intruder theory, these are the most compelling persons of interest, in my opinion. Gary Oliva. You know, the good old Gary Oliva. The fact that he did call his high school friends on the same day when John Benet was actually discovered is very interesting, right? Did he know? Did he just find out casually about, like, uh, the case? Did he, like, walk past the neighborhood and saw the commotion and found out? Or maybe it was broadcasted locally or something like that, right? Um, also... He was in the vigil. Why was he in the vigil, right? I mean, that's pretty crazy. But I do think he was a crazy person who he also like said that he killed Suzanne Chase, which is crazy. And the DNA didn't match. So make of it what you will, right? So we have John Mark Carr. Definitely seemed like another interesting person because the Ramsey stated that he is a suspect. He, 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 they brought him as a suspect even before police knew of him as a potential suspect. He had that connection with John, John Benny Ramsey from way back in, a, in Atlanta, Georgia days, apparently, when they were all living in Georgia. Um, you know, he provided a really interesting and detailed account of events when he said that he killed John Benny Ramsey so he wanted us to believe at some point that he did kill John Benny Ramsey allegedly right his uh, as I've said earlier his uh, explanation of how things went down make no sense because it involves him touching and, and putting his fingers in, in, in certain areas and then those areas did not have his DNA later on so I don't know how you explain that so your opinions on John Markar? I'm really curious to find out. The caretaker, Linda. Now, she was interesting for a little while for me because uh, she did need money. She did have access to the house. She knew the floor plans. But I find it very hard. By the way, no DNA found, by the way. Uh, I find it very hard that Linda would kill John Benny Ramsey for $2,000. Well, maybe at that point... She was money hungry and she did think that maybe I'll get $118,000 and maybe an $118,000 would make a person who needs money even more excited by, about the money and they would think that it's worth killing John Benet. But I mean, the relationship between her and John Benet, to my understanding, was really good or something like that. So I don't know if she would have the guts to actually kill John Benet, you know, for some money. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, f it's, I find it really hard to believe. And the last intruder theory suspect, in my opinion, who probably is, is right now I'm thinking probably the most credible guy is that ninja who 
assaulted that girl named Amy, I believe, who was 14 and lived only two miles away. And this was and this happened like within a year from John Benny Ramsey's death, right? And he got away like a ninja and the MO was exactly the same. He went in there at night, parents were at sleeping, and he managed to somehow sexually assault that girl and then escape. And he is not being found. So, I mean, that's a real ninja. And I mean, if an intruder did kill John Benny Ramsey, that also would have to be like a, a an expert level ninja. So, I actually think out of all of these people, probably that guy or a woman, but I would assume that was a guy, is probably the most uh, credible, right? I mean, what are your opinions regarding these four people I've just mentioned? And lastly, to conclude, the intruder theory. I want to remind everyone that the main reason why the DA in 2008 cleared the Ramses was because of three DNA samples that belonged to an unknown male and you know those samples were found on John Benny Ramsey so these samples have not matched to most or maybe actually any of the persons of interest I've just talked about. Therefore, I find it very hard to believe that any of these people actually are responsible for the death of John Benny Ramsey. Now, I'm not saying that John Benny Ramsey couldn't have been killed by an intruder. However, maybe the unknown male is actually the killer. We don't know. But until we get a DNA match, I'm not looking to cast any suspicion suspicion, any additional suspicion on any of the proposed persons of interest that I've just mentioned because unless I know that the DNA is matched because that's the only thing that cleared the Ramses if you can't match the DNA then that's not our guy you know that's someone who's a creepo He's a creepy guy, but if the DNA doesn't match, then I don't buy it. Because if the DA tells us the Ramses are not responsible because of DNA, then we have to go with the DA. If the DNA doesn't match, then the man is not our catch. Right, and finally we arrive at the family member theory. This is another set of uh, different scenarios that could involve one of the family members, which would be either, you know, John Benet's father, John Bennett Ramsey, the mother, Patsy Ramsey, or even, you know, the older brother, Burke Ramsey. And people that are, you know, actively arguing for the, in, for the family member th theory as opposed to the intruder theory, they usually bring up a certain scenario that could have happened um, on the day when John Benny Ramsey was murdered and I think the best way for us to uh, figure out the plausibility of you know a family member being involved in the killing of John Benet is actually to look at each of these individual how should I put it uh, scenarios right but I think if we're going to be talking about family members there are a few things that we need to mention before we actually get into the three family members there are other more extended family members such as john andrew ramsey who was the son of john ramsey from that marriage with luciana if you recall that from episode number one so john andrew ramsey this is gonna be a really crazy situation he did some like i mean just listen in right now first things first john andrew ramsey has a very strong alibi he was apparently in atlanta at the time when this was all happening so he couldn't have possibly been there uh you know in boulder colorado but some people argue that he did have in fact some time uh, to fly over to Boulder then fly back uh, it's it's like it's a stretch in my opinion but this is what I found very interesting about the guy there was apparently an informant 
who informed law enforcement, and he was apparently a boatman or something like that, that John Andrew Ramsey offered $10,000 for the boatman to cause a boat accident with John Benet aboard during Memorial Day of 4th of July 1996, so the same year. I mean, this is probably BS, but it's out there. And now this is the crazy part, right? Now this this is gonna this is gonna be a big one. Remember the suitcase where some theorized that an intruder was trying to actually, you know, put John Benet Ramsey in that suitcase, that blue suitcase, and transport her out of the G Ramsey residence, right? Well, that suitcase belonged to John Andrew Ramsey, and inside of that suitcase. There was a blanket that contained John Andrew Ramsey's semen, which would mean that he did his thing on the blanket, put the blanket in the suitcase, and left the suitcase just in the middle of the basement for oh, how knows long. So he did his thing in the blanket, put the blanket in the suitcase, right? and just left it there so i don't know guys I, I really don't know what to make of this i will say there's a possibility that this sample of semen is very minute and it wasn't like like jizz was dripping on the blanket if you know what i mean it's probably not that so it's probably like a small sample size i mean that's what i'm assuming or maybe it was a or, covered in, in it so who knows right but also people that argue that john ramsey was the culprit uh the way they explain the alibi is that he was the mastermind of the killing and he ordered uh, two other culprits i don't want to go into that rabbit hole because i do find it pretty hard to believe that john and ramsey was involved but you know the the semen definitely uh, makes a the honorable mention list for sure in the in the you know in the theory at least let's remember that out of the three uh kids from the marriage with luciana you know john's kids uh one uh, daughter has passed away even before john ben benny ramsey died uh that's a little bit um but we also have that other daughter melinda ramsey who's only a you know person of interest here uh, just because you know she's in the family and we're talking about the family members right so we're talking about every one of them and melinda apparently had her palm print was actually found on the door jam to the wine wine cellar room in which john benny ramsey body was found so i mean her palm print was there but but she was also in georgia at the time so it's really hard for us to, you know, think that she would, out of jealousy, for some reason, just fly to Boulder, kill John Benet, and then go back to Georgia, because I think she was, like, with her boyfriend or something like that the whole day. So it's pretty, um, I'd say it's pretty, uh, the, the likelihood is pretty low. And then, lastly, I want to jump uh, in terms of the, <laughs> uh, how should I put it, uh, extended family members, is... A guy named William Ramsey, but for some reason his nickname is Bill, like Bill Ramsey, something like that. So this guy, I'm pretty sure he doesn't even exist. And some uh, Reddit posters are saying that there's like a, a, uh, a, like William Ramsey, who is the illegitimate son of John Ramsey. And according to this theory, he traveled from New Jersey, killed John Benet, and then returned back to New Jersey. But from my understanding, there, this guy doesn't even exist. So I'm not even gonna focus on that. So some some people think that John Ramsey had another illegitimate son, William Ramsey. But I think this is like really wacky. So I'm not even gonna go that route. And now we arrive at the tree family members that could be responsible for the death of John Benet Ramsey. Before we get into the various scenarios that could have happened in regards to the family member theory, we should look at certain details that are perceived as suspicious from people who are looking towards this line of thinking. So 
uh, one of the one of the things that is usually brought up is you know that causes suspicion for a lot of people is the fact that the Ramses actually delayed police interviews, so the parents were not cooperative in talking with authorities uh, in a timely fashion. I think there was a situation where they talked to CNN before they talked to the police, so we have that. Also, they placed strict conditions on how they would be interviewed in April of 1998. Uh, pretty much, the quote is, John Ramsey wrote a letter to Boulder District Attorney at the time, Alex Hunter, at home and offered to meet. The, the only ground rule was no Boulder police would be allowed in the room, so he was willing to meet with uh, DA uh, Alex Hunter, the same DA who decided not to press those charges that the grand jury did provide, you know, so who knows what that was all about. Uh, also, uh, the Ramses lawyered up very quickly, they immediately got lawyers uh, and things like that. And also, there, there was a situation where it definitely seemed, at least in the initial stages, how they were sort of trying to protect themselves more than actually trying to find out who killed, uh, you know, John Benny Ramsey. So that's another suspicious detail that some people find, you know, suspicious. There were also apparently inconsistencies in the stories told by the Ramseys when their various accounts in the media and police interviews were compared and didn't really match. So uh, these would relate to whether John Benet Ramsey was actually asleep when they got home from the Whites on Christmas night. And this is something I've actually speculated here on this episode as well. So uh, it's uh, whether she was awakened before being put to bed and the other event that occurred on the morning she was found missing. Skeptics argue these inconsistencies are evidence of deception and deliberate cover-up and infer that since innocent parties would have no reason to lie, this would mean that the Ramses are guilty either of killing their daughter or perhaps covering up for, you know, Burke Ramsey. And then also we have uh, Linda Hoffman, uh, the caretaker of John, John Benet, right? The one who got denied the two stacks uh, by uh, Patsy Ramsey, that small loan of two stacks, right? So she worked for the family as a cleaning woman for nearly 14 months prior to John Benet's death. So she was working there for a while, you know, like over a year. And she asserted that the Ramseys had a troubled marriage. Uh, Miss Hoffman also said that Mr. Ramsey berated Miss Ramsey for being a, quote, lousy homemaker and a cook. And shortly before the murder, this happened and that the couple, this is uh, Linda's quote, never once demonstrated any affection for each other, physical or otherwise, in front of her. So she's saying that the family had some personal, like, frictions, right? So that's what she's saying. Also... Some people theorize that the Ramses are purposely throwing their acquaintances under the bus, pretty much. And one of one of such uh, incidences apparently involves Fleet White Jr., like so, like Fleet White's son, because the Ramses mentioned Fleet White in varying contexts, all while overtly denying that he believed he was capable of such a killing so i don't i don't even know like it says here that they were accusing fleet white jr but i'm not sure maybe they meant fleet white himself because there was a rift and apparently the ramses mentioned fleet white in like different contexts like over and over again but then they denied it that he could have been involved so maybe potentially like throwing in like red hearings that you know, look into Fleet White. I mean, he was here as well, like, uh, like covertly trying to say that. And also, we obviously have uh, Linda Powell, who, you know, I think Patsy Ramsey, uh, I think, uh, pretty much brought up the the money situation to the cops. So some people think that, uh, you know, the Ramseys are purposely trying to accuse uh, Linda Powell or, like, cast suspicion on Linda as well. So... 
it seems like they're casting suspicion rather than actually trying to get to the, the bottom of this so some people actually found that pretty interesting also remember patsy's sister who also won that uh west virginia miss thing uh like three years later so that was weird but she also makes another appearance so pam pow makes an appearance and sh many believe that she was able to remove and in uh, pretty much remove any incriminating evidence when she actually was allowed to return to the house for funeral clothes because apparently the house was secured no one was uh, let in but they let pam pow get back to the house uh, where apparently she could have removed all of the evidence that would probably link the Ramses to the murder but I think this would pretty much also involve law enforcement being in on it so that's why I think it's a stretch like the, this would sort of entail to us that maybe law enforcement was also in on this whole shindig when they left let like a Pam Pow return to you know the house um, I think it's a stretch like how would Ah, I don't know, it's, it's a stretch in my opinion. There's a whole situation with the American doll that has been ordered and the order was in the name of John Benet and the dress was actually location of Axis graphic and apparently you could have that duct, the duct tape found in the crime scene could have came from this American doll that I don't even know what the situation is but some believe that John Ramsey may have ordered this doll in case he was asked for the other one by police so they wouldn't notice missing duct tape something like that so some people are thinking that the duct tape that was missing from the Ramsey's residence could have came from it, some American doll that was ordered in the name of John Benet and the dress was Axis graphic. I mean, I have no idea how, what to make of this. Uh, I think it's it's also a massive stretch at this point. And before we jump to the family member theories, the individuals, the three individuals, I think it's also worth mentioning the people that argue for the intruder theory, right? What they argue as defending factors in this case that sort of, you know, advocate for the innocence of the three family members. So these are uh, those things. The first thing that the, the suspicious regarding the inconclusive results regarding the lie detector tests because apparently when Gerald yeah Gerard Toriello tested John Ramsey in April of 2000 for a total of five hours and Patsy Ramsey for a total of four hours their results came inconclusive and people that would argue that an intruder did the killings right did the killing of John Benny Ramsey would say that Incon they were inconclusive for the fact that both of the parents at that time were taking Prozac and had anxiety and mental and physical fatigue. So that's what they're uh, how they're explaining that. So the Ramses apparently did endure th tough questions for around 40 two hours. So they, the parents endured very tough questions by law enforcement. Uh, the June 1998 interviews, quote, conducted by veteran homicide detectives from other cities, went on for 42 hours. So it's if, even if we think that the Boulder police was uh, had their hands tied behind their backs for some reason, um, you know, people from other cities were uh, asking questions and interrogating them. So and that's one thing. And also, let's remember that Burke Ramsey was also interrogated. And uh, I mean, well, okay, Burke Ramsey's interviews are really suspicious, so I'm not gonna argue <laughs> that he passed them with flying colors, right? And then another, you know, last thing that I found very compelling that would advocate for the Ramseys is the fact that if it was actually a cover up for Burke Ramsey, would they potentially risk their own freedom? knowing that Burke Ramsey wasn't even old enough to be like charged in a serious manner. Now, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, so I'm not gonna get into those details. I'm sure you could like dig something up, but would they risk it all and incriminate themselves, you know, um, if they were covering for Burke Ramsey? Wouldn't they just want to, you know, uh, sort of uh, 
try to I don't know come clean and and try to make sure that Brooke Ramsey you know gets like some sort of a psychologist or something like that and gets out like in a few years wouldn't they try to push in that direction would they actually risk their own uh you know freedom and business and all the success for you know trying to cover up for Brooke Ramsey that's also very interesting and then the fact that I wonder like if um let's say this is a very important point uh in this uh situation where would a parent accidentally hit a daughter in the head with something and then use a garrote to kill that ch child instead of um calling the police or the ambulance or something like that I mean, maybe if they already thought that the kid was dead, but then they found out that he was not dead, and it's like way too late, and that's how we do it. That's gonna, that's how we're gonna end Jombani's life, right? I mean, maybe that makes sense, but I still find it uh, pretty hard to believe that because apparently, according this is very important, according to the autopsy, she died of asphyxiation, which would mean that the blow to the head was not the killing factor which would mean that one of the parents would have had to actually strangle John Benet uh, and she would have had to like die in that manner that's a pretty sick manner to kill someone in my opinion so that's pretty hard and that would pretty much uh, tell us if she did die from asphyxiation and not from that blow to the head and if asphyx and if the garrote was actually the used in the killing of John Benet Ramsey and was not just there so that it would be a part of a staging procedure you know it was part of a stage if it actually was used to kill John Benet Ramsey then I think it's really hard to believe that Burke Ramsey himself went broke that paintbrush made the garrote right and then strangled his sister die like I find it really hard to believe that that was the case I think if Burke Ramsey accidentally hit her uh or for some reason hit her uh, sister in the head right with that with some object um then I think I think uh the family members finding out this accident and then rushing to John Benny Ramsey and then ah, well Burke you did a mistake now she's barely alive and you know we just got to finish the job you know we just celebrated Christmas we had a happy dandy time now you accidentally hit your sister she's pretty injured but we got to do what we got to do and let's just finish the job right so I think it's a really like it's hard for me to comprehend that that could have happened you know like that's hard to comprehend that's why I'm sort of I was leaning a lot towards Burke Ramsey, but now I'm sort of leaning back a little bit from Burke Ramsey because if he did hit John Benet Ramsey in the head with that object, then I think the natural reaction of the parents would be call the ambulance rather than let's finish the job, Burke. You know what I mean? I feel I feel like that's a that's hard for me to comprehend. Okay, so let's begin with John Ramsey himself, the father of John Benet Ramsey, and why would he be potentially responsible for the death of John Benet Ramsey, right? So almost all of the theories uh, regarding John Ramsey's involvement, uh, almost all of them incorporate either prior sexual abuse or child pornography as being the motivating factors uh, that would lead John Ramsey to kill his daughter. In some theories, the killing was accidental, like an erotic asphyxiation game gone bad. And then other theories uh, state that the killing was deliberate and it was motivated by anger towards John B. Ramsey or fear the John Brady Ramsey would come clean with what has been happening, you know, when these theorists say that John Ramsey was potentially uh, doing some sick stuff, right? I think if we want to speculate uh, regarding John's involvement uh, as him being the sole culprit, we need to prove that there was no intruder and that nor Patsy nor Burke knew of what was happening and they were not involved in the staging of the crime. 
So I think one of the details that people uh, always attach to this uh, theory is the fact that there were dark fibers matching John's shirt that were found in JonBenet's crotch. So I don't know what to make of it. I don't think there's a direct link to John Ramsey because let's remember, I think the DNA pretty much cleared them. I mean, to, to, to some degree that they could be cleared because apparently they all touched John Benet. So I don't think uh, the parents could be cleared, right? But there was a dark shirt, uh, like dark fiber matching the shirt of John Benet, or John Ramsey. So you know, you, you know what I'm trying to say here, right? Also, John Ramsey apparently did pass a lie detector test, or at least one of them or something like that. Skeptics are dubious about this test, uh, stating that in their highly publicized polygraph, Patsy was asked about a ransom note, but John was not asked about a ransom note. So the polygraphers were not independent also. They were actually hired by Ramsey's lawyer, so therefore there would be some sort of a client lawyer client privilege uh, going on there in regards to the polygraphers ultimately we only have the ramsey's word for it that they passed the polygraphs uh you know so i guess that's what people cling to that so people also cling to the american doll apparently it's unbelieved that the duct tape could have been used from that doll, which I don't know if that's even substantiated by anything else, for se. Um, the fact that John found the body was pretty strange, to some indicating that he probably knew where the body was before he even located it, and it was all a, a, a sham, the whole ordeal, right? Um, people stated was very weird how he immediately picked her up and pretty much contaminated the, the scene pretty badly when he moved the body upstairs, uh, placed it on the ground and moved it next to the Christmas tree, placed it there, uh, you know, Patsy Ramsey was all over the body, so people are speculating that John could have potentially been responsible for the staging of the body to some extent so you know these are like the main things that i think cling towards john ramsey so i don't know for me personally like i'm just gonna give my opinion right now i do find those uh sexual abuse child pornography links in this case like hard to believe because i have not seen any evidence regarding people just speculating so if we had some sort of sexual abuse actual like evidence like or or anything to indicate that we would I, like i would probably say that this is uh, a stronger case but I, I just find it hard to believe because the sole thing that people focus in regards to john ramsey being involved is that creepy situation like that he had some sort of a creepy uh Thing that he was doing with John Benet, which I don't know where this is coming from. Is this just speculation, or do we have actual like evidence linking John Ramsey to John Benet and them doing weird stuff? You know. Okay, now let's jump to Patsy Ramsey, the mother of John Benet Ramsey, right? So let's remember one thing that she had cancer. So everything that we talk, you know, how we had to like focus on the DNA uh, matching and mismatching when we were talking about intruder theories. Well, on Patsy Ramsey, let's remember the fact that she had cancer and I think it's underlooked. Like it's a pretty serious thing to happen to a person that definitely could change their mental state in some extent. I'm not saying anything as of yet, but she did have ha cancer and I think that's underlooked. Let's keep that in mind when we investigate her further. Okay, so everyone remember Steve Thomas. He was actually uh, a lead detective in the case at some point and he wrote a book, I believe, and that book uh, had a theory in it and he theorized that Patsy Ramsey was involved in the death of John Benet Ramsey because of a bed wetting accident and once she found out that uh, uh, the John Benet had uh, wetted the bed uh, because she she and Burke apparently had bed wetting issues 
um, or at least Burke had them previously, but didn't have them at that point in time. I'm not sure, but I think uh, John Benet was still at the process where she had like bedwetting issues. And you know, the lead detective Steve Thomas believes that upon the discovery of the bedwetting occurrence, Patsy Ramsey, in a fit of rage, most likely in the bath, slammed John Benet's head in the bath or something like that. And that's how, you know, that was what led to the staging of the crime. So let's uh, look into it a little bit more in depth right now. So the timeline would be that uh, everyone goes to bed at 10.30 p.m. at somewhere maybe around midnight or something like that. Uh, because we could probably link that neighbor sighting of the upper kitchen lights being dimmed low on midnight on the Christmas night, right? If we could connect that, that somewhere around 12, you know, 12 p.m. in the midnight, J John Benet wakes up because she went to the bed and, you know, upon the discovery, uh, Patsy Ramsey, you know, does the unthinkable. She injures with a blunt object John Benet in the head or something like that, right? And then she proceeds to cover up everything. So she makes the garrote with or without John's help. Because this is a big um, point of contention whether or not that John was involved at that particular point in time. But if this was the case, right? If, John, if Patsy Ramsey staged the crime scene on her own, I still strongly believe that at that point John Ramsey in the morning would have figured out that, yo, this ransom note makes no sense, Patsy, you have to, you could have done a better job right here, but, but screw it, I'm gonna follow along with this and, you know, that's how that whole situation went down. Or people are stating that shortly after that fit of rage, maybe John Benet Ramsey released that scream that another neighbor heard and that's when everyone in the family proceeded to stage the crime. I do find it pretty strange if, if John Benet Ramsey did die from asphyxiation. Wouldn't John, upon discovery of John Benet being injured, wouldn't John try to call the ambulance or would John st jump straight to the yo, let's finish the job, Patsy? So I'm, 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 I'm. I have my uh, reservations regarding this theory, but uh, but let's let's just go with it for a second. So in that sense, in the morning, uh, Patsy Ramsey would call the 911 call that we already had um, previously listened to, and she would. Uh, you know, probably fake the phone call. Now, the phone call, I think if they were already spending the whole night, uh, you know, working on the, on the whole uh, situation, like uh, staging the crime scene, I mean, the phone call did seem to me that of a woman who just became in distress, like, maybe, but Patsy Ramsey was a journalist, let's, let's remember, so she had a, an easier time with words, so she could have faked that phone call, that's not out of the question completely for sure, so, you know, that's the whole line of thinking that uh, there was a fit of rage and uh, on the bedwetting. Now, we also have another fit of rage theory, but it's um, not regarding the bedwetting. It's the Marshall rage theory. And uh, I guess some people are uh, stating that maybe Patsy Ramsey was unhappy with her life and depressed and had marsh uh, like uh, martial problems, like uh, maternal problems or something like that. And this was, uh, to some degree, corroborated by uh, Linda, the housekeeper, when, you know, she stated that the Ramses had some sort of a friction going on. So she may have been, like, really angry, really depressed. She did have cancer. All of these things boiling down to maybe, for some apparent reason, slamming John Benet. Uh, in the head with something because she was unstable. I will say that she seemed fairly stable in the proceedings, in the, I don't know, in the CNN interviews, things like that. So I find it hard to believe that that could have been the case. And then also we have like the uh, Munchausen by proxy syndrome theory where Patsy Ramsey apparently 
had like a bizarre mental illness that helped spark a raged fuel episode uh, leading to John Bonet's savage murder. Uh, so that's an explosive scenario that's being sort of, you know, proposed and things like that. We have sexual abuse uh, about uh, Patsy Ramsey. I find it hard to believe because Patsy Ramsey, from all of those videos that I've seen prior to the, uh, you know, Christmas of 1996, where uh, John Benet and her mother is at the at their home and they're all like happy and things like that, I find it hard to believe that they could potentially have some sort of a sexual abuse situation going on in there. I mean, uh, I think. You know, I, f I really feel strongly that if previous sexual assaults or sexual uh, exploitation of John Benny Ramsey were taking place by, I don't know, John Ramsey and Patsy Ramsey, I mean, that's that would probably show up somewhere in the pageants, right, or something like that, because John Benet was an, an active person for a, for a young girl, right, she was very active, she was all over the place, everyone knew her, like, she was the little star of the Ramsey family, so would she not ever show any signs, I mean, maybe there are signs, and I have not just seen them, so, I don't know, if you guys know of any signs, then leave uh, those, uh, you know, contact me and tell me about them, and the last one I really found very disturbing, disturbing and maybe just the way it has been written I found very disturbing and it's called John caught in the act so I think a lot of people already know where this is going but let's just look at it so some people believe that maybe you know John was playing games and whatnot with the uh, with John Benet right at the middle of the night on Christmas night and John Benet like uh, released a scream and you know in this in this line of thinking Patsy was already had like her reservations that that may have been going on and then she woke up and she was like oh no what am I gonna find because she wakes up and John's not w with her in the bed and she heard like a loud scream from John Bede and, he, and she's like this is not good so she took some object probably a flashlight right and he goes and she goes to like uh, to, to like uh, near the screams, and then she opens the door, and bam! You know she found she finds John, uh, you know, in that manner doing those things, and then she slams apparently and accidentally hits uh, accidentally hits uh, John Benet. So yeah, that's a that's a line of thinking being proposed as well. So let's jump to what actually incriminates uh, Patsy. So I think the sole thing that incriminates Patsy the most, in my opinion, and I think everyone will agree, is the ransom note. Now I've talked extensively about the ransom note on the previous episode, and yeah, I do find the, the writing mannerisms very similar. Like Mr. Ramsey was really creepy like i will say and just in general the whole uh, writing style is crazy and then also you know a lot of the words uh, were uncommon for the average person that were left in the ransom note but those particular words were common for the ramsey so it's like uh what do we have there the ransom note everything was used from patsy's belongings to make the ransom note so I mean, yo, I have like st really strong suspicions as of right now that Patsy Ramsey did write that ransom note because I find it hard to believe that someone actually goes in the house, spends 20 minutes to write the ransom note, like while trying to not get detected, while trying to make sure that Pat like everyone's asleep and John Benet's dead. And I don't know, that's just hard for me to comprehend. How would that even be a possibility? So I do think that Patsy Ramsey, like if I had to bet, on, if I had to bet, like, guess who wrote the uh, the ransom note? An intruder or Patsy Ramsey? If I had to bet, like, my money right now, I would actually bet Patsy Ramsey. I'm not saying that's a safe bet. I'm definitely not saying that's a safe bet. That's a bet that I would not make on my own accord. But if I was forced to make a bet at gunpoint, then I would bet Patsy Ramsey at this point. I mean, that's just my opinion. I mean... That's what I've gathered so far. So uh, pretty much that's what's uh, linking her, the, that ransom note. The, the ransom note was definitely really suspicious. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, another interesting detail regarding her is that according 
to a veteran Colorado journalist and former editor-in-chief to the Denver Post, Chuck Green, quote, some investigators say that Patsy Ramsey was wearing the same clothes on the morning of the murder as she wore the previous night and that her side of the Ramsey bed hadn't been slept, it, slept in, indicating that she did not sleep on the Christmas night and she was maybe the whole night staging the scene, right? So that's apparently what's out there. Like, apparently she wore the same clothes on on the Christmas party day and then in the morning and her bed was not slept in so I don't know I don't know and this leaves Burke Ramsey so you know Burke Ramsey please I do not want any lawsuits so uh, you know I'm not saying that you've done anything here I'm just speculating the possibilities without making any conclusions like I'm not making any conclusions Burke you know just just speculating but and I'm not even speculating. I'm just saying what other people are speculating. So this is like a, new, a news report on Burke Ramsey. And Burke Ramsey, right? Mostly all of the theories surrounding Burke Ramsey involve the family members, Patsy and John, covering up the case. And I will say, like, let's stamp this out the be out the beginning. Like, let's get this one thing straight. I don't see how Burke Ramsey makes the garrote, strangles... John Benny Ramsey writes a ransom note and then goes to bed. You know, I don't see that happening. So, since we already cl cleared that, I think any sort of Burke Ramsey involvement already immediately connects the Ramseys, the parents, right? Because I think the finishing, finishing kill would have had to be done by one of the parents i don't see burke ramsey I, I see burke ramsey potentially by an accident you know hitting john benet in the head like i could see that but i'm not saying that even happened I'm, I'm really not not even feeling super strong about that but i could see that happening but i don't really see that happening right now now that would mean that the finishing kill would have been done by one of the uh, parents because i just can't comprehend Burke like finishing the job himself and only then the parents finding out that oh Burke just finished the job before we could call the ambulance I think if that was the case then the family members definitely finished the job with the garrote you know what I mean so that's one thing I want to get straight out immediately remember that uh, CBS the case of John Benny Ramsey right so in that whole uh, documentary uh, if you can call it that dr werner spitz concluded and this is why he got like pinched in the butt so hard in the um, in the courts and stuff like that his conclusion is quote it's the boy who did it whether he was jealous or mentally unfit or something i don't know of the why i'm not a psychiatrist but what i am sure about is what i know about him that is what happened here that's uh, the ending of this quote is retarded, but uh, at least we know that he indicates he strongly believes that you know Burke was involved in that Dr. Spitz guy. He's like an Austrian evil scientist guy, so he's apparently like ready, really credible and been in the game for like a million years at this point. So, the main lines of thinking in regards to Burke Ramsey being responsible well, first is accidental death that you know. Some, somehow he accidentally hit John Benny Ramsey in the head and you know uh, that's when the family members decided to cover up the scene uh, in the hopes of not losing their only surviving child because in you know the, the family members would be like you know we, John Benny is already dead so we can't lose Burke as well so at least let's try to save Burke if, if it if it was an accident and the parents knew it was an accident i see their motivation thinking this is an accident but the public will never understand this so let's protect burke ramsey we know this was an accident also uh, if it was not an accident people are thinking that it may have been some anger issues uh, maybe regarding the stolen pineapple i've talked extensively about that you know john benet ramsey wakes up in the in the middle of the night finds burke in the kitchen eating pineapple steals a piece of the pineapple 
pineapple and then wabam uh you know berg uh, hits her in the head uh, and then the cover-up proceeds jealousy is also been a factor uh proposed by a lot of uh, people online that maybe he was jealous that you know now pa uh, you know patsy is giving all the attention to john benet because with all the pageants and things like that and then also we have uh, obviously we have sexual uh sides of the line of thinking that maybe he was the uh, playing doctor with uh, john benet uh, and things like that right and then uh somehow it all went really bad so these are like the lines of thinking that we have in terms of uh brooke ramsey being responsible one thing that is very interesting and i think uh is a worthy mention right now is that 911 call why well let's remember when i was analyzing that phone call on part two of the series well that's when i sort of came to a conclusion that if we can hear Burke Ramsey on the 911 phone call made by Patsy Ramsey in the morning, that's when we should cast a lot of suspicion towards the family members because the family members stated that Burke Ramsey was asleep during this time and Burke himself said that he was sleeping. So, you know, if you could... If you, if you could find out that we do hear Burke Ramsey on the 911 call, that would mean that the parents lied. And then, you know, we would think, what else could they have lied about? You know, that's a line of thinking right there. And also, I will say, uh, another thing that's incriminating uh, Burke is those really suspicious, um, let's say, uh, uh, interviews. Uh, both when he was a kid and when he is already an adult so when he was a kid he was uh, interviewed by law enforcement people and he was like sitting back and he was like uh, really acting weird when they asked him to like look at the pineapple bowl do you remember that he was like really leaning in towards it and it's, it just seemed like really a weird situation where he's like trying to sort of maybe pretend that it's uh, not a big thing but in the back of his head as he was looking at the pineapple that was a bowl of pineapple that was presented to him uh in the picture he was like uh i don't know i don't know so maybe it was that sort of a situation and then also when he was on dr phil i believe like he was smiling all throughout that thing so some people think that that's a creepy smile and some people think that that's an anxiety smile that he did um i don't i don't even know what to make of that smile that was definitely very creepy but i'd say at that point he's probably old enough to realize that yo this smiling on purpose would incriminate me so i don't see the the re like in his like he seemed like a pretty like at least not a stupid person right so it, it, to me personally i would say that he probably would know better not to smile on purpose so he probably was not smiling on purpose on um you know uh, dr phil's show maybe that's just how his face works right he always makes these uh interesting facial expressions uh that may seem out of whack with the you know things that he's talking about or or hearing about you know what i mean all right so the thing that i found very interesting uh, in regards to burke ramsey being involved potentially is the fact that there is actually nothing li linking him to the crime like literally nothing concrete you know how at least for john ramsey we have that uh, you know fibers that matched his shirt or were like similar to his shirt found in the crotch area of John Benet. with Patsy we have the handwriting that's very similar but with Burke Ramsey we have nothing other than he was seemed odd in his interviews and just seemed odd like his oddness is the only thing that we have we don't have anything concrete that would link him to the murder of john benet so it's hard for me to speculate in that in that sense i don't actually want to speculate all that much i do agree he was acting creepy and obviously you know he had that golf uh, club incident where he apparently by accident uh, at least the parents claimed that he by accident hit john benet in the face with the golf club I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that particular uh, situation. So I think I'll just leave it here. I think we don't have anything concrete in regards to Burke Ramsey. But I will say he is an interesting 
character for sure and i'm not saying that it's not a possibility but i'm definitely not saying that it's a strong possibility and i'm also definitely saying please don't sue me burke ramsey and now finally we arrive at my conclusions i'm not even sure if anyone is still here in this podcast if anyone is still in in this podcast then you're a real champ you know what i mean like congratulations for getting through all of this craziness and you finally arrived to my conclusion you know i definitely made you wait a long time but the time has finally come and i will present my line of thinking in this case so pretty much the single handedly the most important fact in this case the one thing that is the most important thing in this case and this may come as a surprise to some people it's not the handwriting it's not the dna it's not anything it's whether or not john benny ramsey died because of the blow to the head or whether or not she was killed by asphyxiation with the garrote and the blow to the head either came prior to that or after that so the cause of death by a, an autopsy performed on december 22nd so two days after she died 1996 by coroner dr john mayer concluded that john benet was alive before she was asphyxiated by ligature strangulation former boulder police chief mark beckner has been quoted as saying that brain swelling indicated john benet lived between 45 minutes to two hours after the fracture if we believe that the autopsy is correct and John Benny Ramsey was hit in the head with an object and then was killed by asphyxiation, I strongly believe that Burke Ramsey is not the killer. Why? Because I don't think upon discovery one of the parents finding out that Burke Ramsey just hit John Benet in the head by accident or a fit of rage or anything, you know, he has been hitting her with golf clubs. So if he hit her in the head, I don't see personally, and this is a strong point statement, boy, I don't see one of the parents going straight for the garrote and finishing the job instead of calling the ambulance i do not see that this leaves us an intruder or two family members john and patsy let's bring it back to the intruders none of the proposed intruders had been linked by dna now i will say i still think that the boulder police was at least or like the district attorney at least they had some sort of credibility and were not completely in cahoots trying to cover it up i don't see them covering it up therefore i will take their statements regarding the dna evidence of three samples of an unknown male found on two pieces of clothing worn by john benny ramsey on the christmas night to be credible L credible evidence that does i mean i will i would not say that it in particular clears the ramses but it clears everyone who's been proposed to be a person of interest and had their dna tested and connected to the crime if if that per if you know any of the perpetrators that i've just talked about like an hour or so ago if they have gotten their dna tested and it did not match those three unidentified male samples found on john benny's ramdi's clothing then they are not involved in the killing so everyone who i talked about in the persons of interest uh part of the podcast they're not involved in my opinion and this leaves us with two 
options, an intruder that has never been proposed as an intruder, potential intruder, someone who's not even been linked to this case ever, so he's not one of the 140 suspects that a law enforcement was looking at, or the Ramses, but the parents, not Burke. So, let's remember the fact that credible people had stated that on 90% of the cases, unsolved cases, police had already had the suspect in their, on, on their minds within one month. But none of these suspects actually matched the DNA found on John Benet. So what the hell was, does that mean? That means that the likelihood of an unknown intruder is really slim. Like only 10%. Like, okay, this is a crazy case. It's Christmas night. It's, it's you know, the Ramsey family. It's a crazy event for sure. But still, the likelihood of that is what? 10% if we do the quick math? 90% minus 100%, that's 10% left. We only got 10% chance, which is, you know, it's a small number for sure. And this leaves us with the family members. This leaves us with John Ramsey and Patsy Ramsey. So out of these two people, the actual evidence is a lot stronger indicating Patsy's involvement than John's because Patsy had that hand written ransom note which looked really similar to, to her writing style and then you know her fingerprints were found on the ransom note but nobody else's so it's like uh what's that all about right right so we would think that she may have written the ransom note but uh John Ramsey's only st like the staging of the crime evidence is I believe that fiber that was just similar uh, to his shirt and that fiber was found in the crotch of John Benny Ramsey, right? So I'd say the evidence linking right to the actual staging of the crime definitely falls pretty much on uh, Patsy Ramsey. So I think Patsy there in my head I will say this I'm leaning strongly towards that Patsy Ramsey one way or another was involved but we don't know in which way and there's no goddamn way to tell as of right now in my opinion because either of the parent could have accidentally killed uh, John Benny Ramsey or at least hit her in the head with a blunt object found that she was not gonna make it or is she severely injured and they were scared and they the growth and finished the job which i don't think they would do if they found out that burke ramsey did it but i do think it's a high possibility that they would do this if they did it now who is the more likely person to hit john benet ramsey for some reason on christmas night i don't know i have no idea whether it was john or patsy people are saying that uh, john benet was bedwetting and indicating that was patsy other people are saying there's some suspicious business going on with John Ramsey. So it could be John. I don't know. I have no idea who hit her. But I think whoever hit her is from that family. And I don't think it was Burke. So only two people are there. And I believe in the staging of that crime, both people would have had to be involved. So I'm not saying this happened. But I'm saying that I'm leaning towards the fact that maybe one of the parents, by accident or by a fit of rage, we can't really tell right, hit John Benet in the head and then discovered that she's probably not gonna make it or were shocked and scared and finished the job with the garrote and staged the crime. And while they were staging, I think both parents were involved already because one found out that the other was staging and they just uh, told Brooke Ramsey go to bed and they gave him like a sweet little story, something like that, right? So I think that's the most plausible line of thinking as of right now. I sure hope I don't get any lawsuits after this. Thank you guys for joining me this week. This has been the longest episode I've ever done and I've like think I've lost a little piece of my sanity uh, during this uh, research, especially for this episode. So, But it's good, you know, the, the crazier I become, the, the more fascinating these podcasts will uh, be in the future. So, 
yeah, I'm I'm really tired at this point. I'm I'm trying to get some sleep right now. Um, yeah, I'm not even gonna say what I'm running on right now because I think uh, these substances are illegal. But I will say that I had a fun time. I had a really good time. I hope no one is actually mad at me because my particular line of thinking doesn't match your particular line of thinking. I mean, I'm open to any ideas. So if you have any, contact me. Leave a comment on the YouTube. Whatever. Do whatever you want, guys. But make sure you check me out next week because we will be back. We're going to be back talking about some crazy cases once again. So uh, stay safe and Peace out, my friends.